Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thing except drunks. And they didn't want anything that sounded like those absolutes. And they said, Bill, you're going to have to change this. Bill said, no, I'm not going to change this. And they said, well, yes, you are. I said, don't you remember? This is our book, not your book. And you're supposed to change anything that we want you to change. <clears throat> he said, well, I'm sorry about that, but I don't intend to change this. They said, oh, yeah, you are. And he said, no, I'm not. And he said, what you guys don't realize he said, these aren't even my words. He says, these words come after prayer and, medita- and meditation. He said, these are God's words. And they said, we don't give a damn whose words they are. <laughs> <clears throat> it's our book, and you're going to change it. And they fought, and they fought, and they fought, and they almost not only almost destroyed the book project, but they almost destroyed the little fellowship over the writing of how it works. Finally, finally, Bill very reluctantly gave in. He said, okay. He said, I'm going to change these things. I'm going to let you have your way. And I'm going to compromise. But then you're going to have to compromise with me. And they said, what do you want? He said, I'm tired. He said, I've been fighting with you and arguing with you all the way through the book, and said, especially so here in this chapter 5 thing. And he said, I'm completely worn out from it. I don't intend to do this anymore. He said, if you want me to finish the book, then you give me the authority to do so. And if you don't want to give me the authority, then you guys will have to finish the book. Well, they didn't want to give him that authority, but they didn't want to finish the book either. They very, very reluctantly agreed to do that. Now, what Bill knew that they didn't know is two pages later, he's going to put you, must, and directions right back in the book. (laughs) You know, he's had it all the way up to here. You find it in different statements all the way up to here. Now, they jerked it out of chapter 5. Then he turns right around and puts it right back in. And it ruins some of the continuity of the book. But now that we can see what actually happened, we can see what Bill really intended for this to be. Simply a set of directions to the individual alcoholic on how to recover from alcoholism. I think the other thing that is so, so obvious when he says our description of the alcoholic, the chapter to the agnostic, Our personal adventures before and after have been designed to sell you three pertinent ideas. A, that you're alcoholic and cannot manage your own life. That's step one. B, that probably no human power could have relieved your alcoholism. That's step two. C, that God can and will. That's the rest of step two. And he said, now, if you're not convinced on these vital issues... You better reread the book to this point. You've missed out on something. And if you don't want to do that, you might as well throw it away. So it's quite obvious all the information that we need for steps one and two are contained in the doctor's opinion and the first four chapters. People come to us today and they say, how do you work steps one and two? And we say, you don't. They are not working steps. They're not action steps. They are conclusions of the mind that we draw based upon the information presented to us in the doctor's opinion in the first four chapters. You know, I've always been powerless over alcohol. As far back as I can remember from the time I took the first drink, I just did not know that I was powerless nor did I know why I was powerless until I read the doctor's opinion in the first four chapters. Now, if I can say to myself today, you betcha I'm powerless over alcohol, my life has become unmanageable, then I'm through with step one. I've taken it. 
There's always been a power greater than I am that could restore me to sanity. I just did not know what the insanity was, nor did I believe that power would do that until I read the doctor's opinion in the first four chapters. And if I can say to myself today, you bet you, I believe there's a power greater than I am that can restore me to sanity, then I'm through with step two. And it's not by accident the very next thing in the book says, being convinced. We were now at step three. So you see the fallacy in trying to get the newcomer to start with how it works. We tell them to go to chapter five. They read all this stuff. They don't know anything about steps one and two. Chapter five starts with step three. And the newcomer can't make that decision because he doesn't know what's wrong with him. <clears throat> he hasn't taken steps one and two yet. So once again, if we can do nothing else all this entire weekend, I hope we can see the value of the doctor's opinion in the first four chapters. And I hope each one of us in working with new people will be able to transmit this information through the big book to the new person so they can also have one and two behind them by the time they get to chapter five, Joe. The book says, being convinced we were at step three. So he told us how it works. Now we're at step three, and now he's going to tell us why it doesn't work. But first of all, he said, being convinced we were at step three. We're not quite ready to do step three yet. Which is that we decided to turn our will and our life over to God as we understood him. Well, just what do we mean by that, and just what do we do? Well, that's good questions, isn't it? We're going to make a decision to turn our will. And what is our will? Our will is our thinking. And our life is our actions. And we're going to make a decision to turn our thinking and our actions over to the care and direction of God as we understood Him. We're getting ready to make that decision to do that. He also says <clears throat> the first requirement is that we be convinced that any life run on self-will can hardly be a success. So he's talking here now about two wills. He's talking about self-will, and he's talking about God's will. And as far as we know, we're the only species here on earth that's ever faced with this decision. Because we're the only species here on earth that has this thing called self-will. You know, God gave us self-will a long, long time ago. He allows us to operate on self-will. But also, there's also God's will standing there. So we really don't have but one or two choices. We can continue to try to run on self-will, make our own decisions, rule our own destiny, and never, never think about God's will. And that's what most of us did before we came to AA. The end result of operating on self-will is what got me into AA to start with. Now, I don't have any choice except to continue to operate on self-will, make my own decisions, rule my own destiny, run my own show, or turn to God's will, one of the two, because there are no other wills here on earth. Now, this goes back to a story that appeared in the great big, big, big book a long time ago. And there was a couple that was in the Garden of Eden, I think is what they called it. Serenity Park. And one of them was named... <clears throat> One of them was named Adam, and one of them was named Eve. And God told them, he said, I give you dominion over everything in this garden. But he said, what I need to tell you is that everything in this garden has to run under my will. And he said, those that run under my will, I take care of. I feed them, I clothe them, I protect them, I give them everything that they need. 
And he said, you have self-will, but as long as you're willing to follow my will, then I'll take care of you just like I do all the other species here in this garden. But if you practice self-will, you're going to get yourself in trouble. And he said, you can do about anything in here you want to do except one thing. Don't eat the apple on the tree. He said, leave it alone. And they left it alone, and life was great. <clears throat> Everything they needed, God provided. And life was good for them and all the other species there in the garden also. Until one day, a little snake comes sidling up to Eve. And he said, Eve, honey, I need to talk to you for a little bit. Eve said, what do you want, snake? He said, what I need to tell you is you've got self-will and you know you've got it. And you don't have to follow his will if you don't want to. He said, if you want to eat that apple, you can eat it. You don't have to do what he says to do. Well, she ran to Adam and she said, Adam, Adam, Adam. <laughs> Did you know that we have self-will and we can eat that apple if we want to? And he said, well, God told us not to eat it. She said, that don't make any difference. We don't have to do what he says. We can eat that apple if we wish. And Adam made a decision. Now, we know today it was a bad decision when he made it. But you can't really knock him. It's the only decision he ever made, or the first one he ever made. <laughs> and they got that apple off that tree, and they ate it. And I guess God was just standing around watching and waiting to see what they were going to do about that apple. Because he came by in a little bit, and he saw the apple was gone off the tree, and he said, uh-oh, uh-oh, they've exercised self-will. So he went to Adam and Eve, and he said, since you've exercised self-will, you've eaten the apple when I told you not to, I don't intend to take care of you anymore. He said, by the way, Adam, why did you eat that apple to start with? And Adam whirled around and pointed at Eve and said, she made me do it. <laughs> Eve might have been the first Alan, I don't know. And God said, okay, you're going to have to leave. He said, I only take care of those that follow my will. And since you've exercised self-will, you're going to have to leave the garden and take care of yourself. And he put them out. And I almost see God standing there with tears in his eyes as they went out. And he said, oh, wait, 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 hold on just a minute. He said, i got a deal for you guys. He said, I love you enough that I'll let you stay out there running on self-will until you completely destroy yourself if that's what you want to do. And he said, I'll never take self-will back. But he said, what I will do if you become willing to give self-will back to me, then I'll take it and you back into the garden and I'll take care of you again like I always have up until this point. And the Oxford grouper said this is a very simple thing. They always said that the exercising of this particular action is giving back to God what God had so freely given to us. In other words, we made a decision to let God be the director of our will. And those of us have been self-directed. It's been a long time since we've had that relationship with God. Also, we like to look at two or three of the words in step three to be sure we understand them as the writer understood them. And we made a decision to turn our will over to the care and direction of God as we understood him. Now, what is our will? Well, our will is nothing more than our thinking apparatus. 
Our will is nothing more than this thing up here in our head that tells us what to do and what not to do. Our will is nothing more than our mind. And I know when I first looked at step three, I became very, very confused and really scared of step three. I told my sponsor, I said, Neil, if, if I turn my will over to the care and direction of God as I understand him, I have no idea what he would have me be. And I said, he might want me to be a missionary. And he might want to send me to China. And I sure as hell don't want to go to China. And he just laughed. He said, well, at least it wouldn't be in the hands of an idiot, would it? <laughs> he said, Charlie, let's look back in your lifetime. You've always been a selfish, self-centered, self-willed human being. You've never paid any attention to God's will, your parents' will, your teacher's will, or anybody else's will. You've always done what you wanted to do whenever you wanted to do it. Isn't that right? And I said, well, you know it is. Well, he said, the end result is, is you have almost destroyed yourself. And he said, just as important, you've almost destroyed the lives of those around you that care for you. He said, now just think. If God could direct your thinking, it might become a little bit better. And he said, if your thinking becomes a little bit better, then probably your whole life's going to become a little bit better too. And he said, if you keep thinking the way you've always thought, you're going to keep doing the same kind of things you've always done, you're going to keep getting the same results, and you're going to destroy your life and the lives of those around you that care for you. Also, we are making a decision not only to turn our will over to the care and direction of God as we understand Him, but we're making a decision to turn our life over to the care of God as we understand Him also. And what is our life? Our life is nothing more than our actions. What I am right now, as of this moment, sitting behind this table, is the sum accumulative total of all the actions I've taken in my entire lifetime as made be what I am today. Now we know all action follows thought. All action follows thought. It says will and life. A lot of people read that step and they say, Life and will. No, it's backwards. It's will and life. Now, if my thinking is okay, then chances are my actions are going to be okay too. And if my thinking is okay and my actions are okay, then my life's going to be okay. But left on self-will, I simply do not stand the chance. I will always think the way I've always thought, I'll keep on taking the same old actions until I absolutely, literally destroy myself. You know, a good example of tying our will together with our mind is let's say that some of us are beginning to approach the end of our lives, and there's a few of us in here that are getting close, and we've gathered up a few material things and we become concerned of what's going to happen to them after we pass on. If we get concerned enough, we'll go sit down with an attorney. And we'll tell that attorney what we want done with these things. I want this to go to my spouse. This is to be my daughter's. I want this to go to my son, so on, so on, so forth. That attorney will take my thinking as of that day, coming from my mind, write it down on a piece of paper in legal form, and I'll sign it, and maybe the attorney will sign it as a witness, and we stick it in the safe. Now, sure enough, a year or two later, I kick the bucket. And if my family's like all the rest of them, they're going to call the undertaker and say, come and get him. And let's get him out to that cemetery about as fast as we can. Now, used to, they waited three or four days. They don't do that anymore. They get you out there about as soon as they can get you there. 
That undertaker gets me out to the cemetery, and there I am suspended in a box over a hole in the ground. And a few people standing around that box. And maybe one of them will say a prayer or two, and I hope it'll be an AA person that says it. And they start dropping me down in that hole. Now, my family's like the rest of them. They're not even going to wait till I get to the bottom of the hole. <laughs> they jump in the car. They head right back to that attorney's office. And that attorney gets out that piece of paper and reads to them what my thinking was two or three years prior to that time when I was sitting there in the office. Now, we know they call that piece of paper a will. It's not by accident. Will, thinking, mind are all synonymous. I'm making a decision to turn my thinking apparatus over to the care and direction of God as I understand Him. I'm making a decision to turn my life over to the care and direction of God as I understand Him. Hopefully, it will get better if I do so. And it seems to be obvious to all of us we should be able to see that self-will is what got us here in the first place. If we had been operating on God's will before we ever came to AA, we wouldn't have become alcoholic. We wouldn't have got into the situations we got into. So self-will is what put me here in the first place. And if I want it to get any better, there's only one other will I can turn to, and it has to be God's will. And hopefully things will start getting better in my life. So that's what I'm really deciding to do, is turn my thinking apparatus and my actions over to the care and direction of God as I understood Him. Very simple process. Not very easy to do, but a simple process. I have to say this. It wasn't the apple in the tree that caused all the problems. It was the pear on the ground. <laughs> Well, the old snake, you know, he didn't have any legs to stand on, so couldn't blame him. He gets worse as we go along, too, I guarantee you. Okay, he told us how it works. Now he says how it doesn't work. The first requirement is that we be convinced that any life our own self-will can hardly be a success. That why That's why it don't work. On that basis, we're almost always in collision with something or somebody, even though our motives are good. Most people try to live by self-propulsion. Each person is like an actor who wants to run the whole show. It's forever trying to arrange the lights, the ballet, the scenery, and the rest of the players in his own way. If his, if his arrangement would only stay put, if only people would do as he wished, the show would be great. Everybody, including himself, would be pleased. Life would be wonderful. Now, wouldn't that, isn't that true? If people would only mind, if people would only mind me and do what I ask them to do, life would be wonderful for them as well as for me. But the only problem with that is, you see, we're all born with self-will. We all have a self-will. My, my will for my wife is one thing, and her will for her is another. And it doesn't always uh, come together that way. So the only trouble we ever have is when I'm trying to force my will on her, or she trying to force her will on me. That's the only time I ever have any trouble. But I know, and I know that I know, that if she would only mind, everything would be wonderful. But she don't mind. And that's the only trouble we ever have. And that's why it don't work. See, some uh, 12 or 13 years after Bill wrote the big book, and after a consultation with some of the best minds in the world at that time, and after many, many experiences of observing and working with us alcoholics, he wrote another little book called The Twelve and Twelve, which John has been going over. And in the area of the fourth step, in the 12 and 12, I think John will be covering soon, the first three or four pages in there is talks about instincts, basic instincts of life, which, cause, which causes people to have self. That, those are the things that make up self. He knew more about us after 12 or 13 years of sobriety and observing us. And in the 12 and 12, in the area of the fourth step, he wrote down there's all these basic instincts of life. And he covered them and masterfully there and and uh, whenever I get ready to do sponsor some way we get ready to do the fourth step they seem to have problems with column three on the inventory process on page 65 
they don't quite understand what part of self is affected. And I always ask them to go back to the 12 and 12 and read about the basic instincts of life, get a working knowledge of those words, see what causes self so they can better understand how to do column three in the big book. You know, Bill wrote the big book to not to replace uh, the, the big book, both the 12 and 12 not to replace the big book. He said these are a set of short stories about the steps to basically help us to work the steps in the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous. You can't really work the steps out of the 12 and 12. There's lots of good information about the steps, but there's no instructions on how to work the steps. The only instructions about how to work the steps is in the big book. And the 12 and 12 gives us more information so that we can better work the steps out of the big book. That's why he wrote the 12 and 12. Well, actually, he wrote the 12 and 12 to, to talk about the traditions. Remember, he was going across the country talking about traditions. They would invite Bill there, and they said, Bill, would you please come to our area? And, but please don't talk about them damn traditions. And he was having a hard time selling the traditions to the fellowship. So he wrote the traditions and a narrative on the traditions. And to, to, to kind of help a little bit, he put the stories about the steps in front of the book, and he called it 12 and 12. Tremendous book, by the way. I think we have to uh, face the fact that when Bill was writing the big book, 1938-1939, Bill was not a great spiritual giant. Bill was not a great student of human nature. Bill studied economics and business as well as law. Bill was a real stock speculator. Yet he was able to write one of the most spiritual books dealing with human nature that the world's ever seen in the big book Alcoholics Anonymous. Surely, surely, God used Bill's hand to write this book. But I also believe as time went by, Bill could see some blind spots in the book. I believe he could see some things that he had wished that he had perhaps expanded on a little bit more. Maybe some things that he had never mentioned in the book itself. And I think by 1950, 51, 52, having worked with many, many alcoholics, having studied with some of the best spiritual minds in the world, some of the best psychiatric minds in the world, Bill knew more about what he was talking about. And sure, sure, he wanted, he wanted some means to carry the traditions. But I think also Bill had some more information that he wanted to give to us in order to be able, for us to be able to work the big book better than we could without that information. And he decided to go ahead and write the 12 and 12. And some of that information in 12 and 12 I think is absolutely fabulous. And the part that Joe's talking about, the first three or four pages on step four, I think it's one of the greatest things I've ever read because it talks about the three basic instincts of life, about those things that make me tick. It talks about those things that make me think the way that I think and cause me to act the way I act. And if I can learn a little bit something about them, then I can really, really see why I need to make this decision back here in step three. Because those basic instincts of life left on self-will rule me, control me, and dominate me. And they cause me all kinds of difficulties. So I think if we would look at them for just a few moments, we're not going into the 12 and 12, but we just want to look at those little three basic instincts of life. Then I think we're going to be able to understand much better as to why we really need to make this decision in step three. He talks about the three basic instincts of life that are God-given. All human beings are born with them. They are absolutely necessary for survival of the human race. And he said if we didn't have these three basic instincts of life, the human race would simply fail to survive here on earth. And they are God-given, and they are good things. He talked about the social instinct, the security instinct, and the sex instinct. 
And first we'll look at the social instinct. He said all human beings are born with a desire to be liked, to be accepted, to be respected by other people. He said all human beings are born with a desire to come together in groups with other people. And he said if we didn't have those desires, if we cared nothing about each other, the world would go into a dog-eat-dog -dog situation and sooner or later, under those conditions, complete anarchy would reign, and eventually the human race would simply fail to survive. So these desires that you and I have to be liked and to be accepted and be respected, these desires that we have to be together with other human beings, they're all God-given, they're good, and they are necessary for our survival. You all have a... Uh some of that you can show it in your little program that shows you this uh, information here that's in that book. Now, under the term social instinct, he used several different words. First, he used the word companionship. And companionship is wanting to belong or to be accepted. So many of us, like I did when I, we were growing up, we, we were on the outside of the crowd in, looking in. We wanted to be a part of, knew we could not be. Knew that whatever we said, whatever we did would be wrong. People would laugh at us. We were absolutely scared to death about what other people thought of us. He uses the term prestige. Prestige is wanting to be recognized or to be accepted as the leader of the group. Now, the world needs leaders. Somebody's got to make decisions. I guess back in the old caveman days, somebody said, John, get behind that tree with your spear. Mary Lou, you get over there with your club. Billy Jack and I'll run this sucker through here and we'll get something to eat. Somebody has to do that. And most human beings will take one of two directions. Either let me be a part of or let me be the leader of. In either case, it's going to be based upon what other people think of us. If they like us and accept us and respect us, then we can become those things that we want to be. He talked about self-esteem. Self-esteem is what we think of ourselves. And it's usually high or low based upon what other people think of us or what we think other people think of us. If they seem to like us and accept us, we feel pretty good toward ourselves. If they seem to reject us, or we even think they reject us, we feel pretty lousy toward ourselves. He talked about pride. Oh, I'm glad I got in the habit of going to the dictionary and looking up words. I always thought pride is something you ought to have. All I ever wanted to be as a young fellow growing up is I wanted to be a man who walked tall with pride and just a little bit sideways like John Wayne did until I looked that word up. And it's defined as an unjustified and excessive opinion of oneself. We either too think too well of ourselves or too little of ourselves, and in either case it really isn't true. Personal relationships, our relations with other human beings and the world around us. Ambitions. Ambitions are nothing more than our plans for the future our plans to be recognized, our plans to be accepted, our plans to be the leader, whatever happens to fall under this particular area, plans for the future. Now, if I want to be liked and accepted and respected by the world and the people in it, the first thing I've got to try to figure out is what is it they want from me? What do I need to do to be liked and accepted and respected? And usually those things are taught to us by society as we grow up. As we see what other people do and they get their recognition, they get their acceptance and etc. Then we ourselves decide those things that we need to do in order to be recognized. And it will vary in different parts of the world. In one part of the world it may be to have a high education. Another part of the world it may be to be a large landowner. Another part of the world, it might be to have a large family. It can be any number of things. Now, we're taught those things by society as we grow up, and based on what we're taught, we set our goals. 
And we begin to work toward completion of the goal, the good education, the large landowner, whatever it might be. And if you're going to reach the goal and become successful, you're going to have to work at it. You can't just be a bum and sit on your duff and do nothing and be liked and accepted and respected by other people. And by the same token, not only do we have to work to reach the goal, we're also going to have to make some sacrifices. You know, there, there are some things that I would really like to do as a human being that are very enjoyable and very exciting, but if I do them and you catch me at it, you're not going to like me at all. And I don't think you and I would do the work necessary to reach the goal or make the sacrifices necessary to be acceptable unless we got a reward for doing so. And the great reward we get, Bill Wilson said it in his story, is at the moment of successful completion of the goal when he said, I had arrived. My God, how many of us have set that goal? We literally worked our tails off for years to get there. And we get there, we successfully complete it, and they pat us on the back and they say, Ah, oh, Joe, you're a fine man, you're a good man, you're a very intelligent person, you're really something else. There's a feeling comes over us which is one of those indescribably wonderful feelings when we get that recognition and et cetera and et cetera and et cetera. Now, the only thing wrong with it, though, it seems to be just a temporary feeling. No sooner do we get the recognition and the praise and the good feeling and we look around and we say, well, hell, is this all there is to it? And we set another goal. And we work and we work and we strive and we strive and we sacrifice and we reach the new goal and we get the recognition, the acceptance, it feels good, and we set another goal. And it seems to create within we human beings an insatiable desire for more and more power, more and more recognition, more and more acceptance, and we're not getting it fast enough and they're not giving it to us the way we think they ought to, so what do we do about that? Well, we start taking a few shortcuts. We begin to do a little lying. We begin to do a little conning. We begin to do a little manipulating of other people. We begin to step on other people's toes and climb on their backs. And the instant we do so, we create pain and suffering for other people. They, in turn, retaliate against us and create pain and suffering for us. Oh, yeah. It's plain that a life run on self-will can hardly ever be a success. Because under those conditions, we're always going to be in collision with people and places and things. The second basic instinct he talked about is the security instinct. Now, I know in AA, we try to live one day at a time. But I also know that nearly everybody in this room has got an insurance policy. And the purpose of the insurance policy is to protect ourselves in the future. And Bill said that all human beings are born with the desire to be secure in the future. He said if we were not concerned about that, we wouldn't provide the food, the clothing, the shelter, the things that we need in order to survive. And the next winter season, we would just simply freeze to death. The next drought season, we would starve to death. So these desires that you and I have to be secure in the future, they're God-given. They're absolutely necessary for our survival. And once again, if we're going to be secure in the future, we're going to have to decide, well, what is it? that I need in order to be secure. And again, society teaches us that as we grow up in the world. And it's going to vary in different parts of the world. One part of the world, you need $4. Another part of the world, you need 4000 Another part of the world, you need $4 million. Another part of the world, you need 99 coconuts. Whatever it is that they use to measure, trade, and barter with, and based on what we're taught, we set our goals and we start working toward that goal. And once again, if you're going to reach the goal and be secure in the future, you're going to have to work at it. You can't just be a bum and sit on your duff and, and, and get the things necessary in order to be secure in the future. By the same token, we're going to have to make some sacrifices. I can't blow it all today and be secure tomorrow. And I don't think you and I would do the work necessary to reach the goal nor would we make the sacrifices necessary to reach the goal unless we get a reward for doing so. And the great reward again comes at the moment of successful completion of the goal. 
How many of us have set the goal as kids growing up for a new bicycle, for a new dress, for a new pair of shoes, for a new suit, for a new automobile, for a new piece of land, for a new home, for a new house, and etc. And we set the goal, and we work, and we work, and we strive, and we strive, and the day that sucker's paid off and nobody can take it away from us, my God, my God, what a great feeling that is. You know, when I was a kid growing up, hardly anybody owned their own homes. Nearly everybody rented. And once in a while, somebody would gather up enough money to make a down payment on a little bitty house of some kind. And they would make payments on that house month after month, year after year, and one day that sucker would be paid off. And what did they do? Well, they had a great party. They called in all the neighbors. And we had a celebration, we had a cake, and we ate the cake, and we drank the drinks, whatever they might be, and we burned the mortgage. What a great feeling that was. But also, just like in the social instinct, it's just a temporary feeling. Hell, I know good sooner get that sucker paid for, and I look around, and I say, is this all there is to this deal? Yeah. He's got a Cadillac, and I'm driving a Chevrolet. This guy over here's got a Brooks Brothers suit, and I bought mine at Kmart's. This woman here over here's got a house a lot bigger than mine, and it causes me to create an insatiable desire for some more things. And I work, and I work, and I strive, and I strive, and I reach the goal, and I feel good, and it doesn't last long, and it creates an insatiable desire for more and more and more and more of these things. I'm not getting them fast enough. They're not giving them to me the way I think they ought to. What do I do about that? I take shortcuts, I lie, I cheat, I con, I manipulate, I steal. The instant I do so, I create pain and suffering for others. They, in turn, create pain and suffering for me. It's plain that a life run on self-will can hardly ever be a success. Under those conditions, we're always in collision with people, places, and things. The third basic instinct he talks about is the sex instinct. I've got to have a drink of water before I start on sex. <laughs> he gets excited about this. He said all human beings are born with a desire to have sex. He said, now they may get turned off by bad teachings or bad happenings, but all human beings are born with a desire to have sex. Because if we don't have sex, we can't reproduce ourselves. And if we don't reproduce ourselves, then sure enough, sooner or later, the human race is going to fail to survive. So these desires that we have for sex, they are God-given and they are good things. But also, just like the other two, if you're going to reproduce yourself through the sex, or through the sex act, you're going to have to work at it. Hell, you can do more work in two or three minutes of sex if you can last that long. Then you'll do all day digging a ditch. Don't you older guys remember how it used to be? My God, you got through with it. You just fell over sideways. Sweat's just pouring off of you. You can hardly get your breath. You feel like you've died, gone to heaven, come back two or three times. And I don't think you and I would do that kind of work if we didn't get a reward for doing so. And the great reward we get is that great feeling, both physically and emotionally, at the moment of successful completion of the sex act. One of the greatest feelings that a human being can experience. But also, just like the other two, it's just a temporary feeling. Hell, you no sooner get through with doing it than you get to thinking about doing it again. <laughs> and it's such an exciting and pleasurable thing. The next thing you know, you get to thinking about doing it in different ways. You get to thinking about doing it in different positions. You get to thinking about doing it with different people. And the next thing you know, we're doing it the wrong way, the wrong time, with the wrong people. And the instant we do so, we create pain and suffering for us. They retaliate for others, and they retaliate against us and create pain and suffering for us. Plain that a life run on self-will can hardly ever be a success. Because under those conditions, the fulfillment of these basic instincts of life, they are so pleasurable that all human beings will overdo in one or more of these from time to time through their lifetime running on a self-will. Now, if you'll notice up there on that picture, there's a little circle coming out of the three basic instincts of life that's called self. 
Those three basic instincts of life are what makes up self-will, the desire to do these things for self-satisfaction, the desire to fulfill the social instinct, the security instinct, and the sex instinct. Now, coming out of self-will, you'll notice another little circle called wrongs. It's another word you've got to look at. Somewhere in AA, we got the idea that the word wrongs was a list of dirty, filthy, nasty things. But if you go to the dictionary and look it up, there are several definitions of the word wrong in the dictionary. One definition is incorrect judgment of others. And we're going to find out when we get into step four, that's exactly what a resentment is. Another definition is incorrect believing. And we're going to find out as we get into step four, that's what most of our fears are. Another definition is the harms and the hurts that we do to other people. And we're going to find out in step four that we're going to have to look at those things and do something about them. It's very easy to spot a selfish, self-centered human being. There are always three common manifestations of self. Number one is they're always madder than hell. Damn him and damn her and by God I'll show them and they're not going to treat me that way and blah de blah de blah 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 blah. A selfish, self-centered human being is always scared to death. Yeah. Can't depend on God. Can't depend on other human beings. If you're an alcoholic reaching the end of the road, you can't depend on yourself any longer. And you've got to be running absolutely scared to death. We don't know what the hell is going to happen tomorrow, but we know when it gets there, it's not going to be worth a damn, whatever it is. A selfish, self-centered human being is always doing things that hurt other people. And we're not bums. And we hurt other people, and we got a little thing called guilt and remorse. And the guilt and remorse begins to just literally eat us up. Now, you take a mind that is filled with resentments. You take a mind that is filled with fear. You take a mind that is filled with guilt and remorse. That mind doesn't feel good. And we run around just so long under those conditions, and we get to wanting to feel better. And the only thing we know at this stage of the game to make us feel better is a drink of alcohol. And we begin to think about taking a drink. Next thing you know, we become insane, and we end up drunk all over again. You know, I don't really think we alcoholics have any choice in this matter. If we want to recover from alcoholism, we don't have any choice about this self-will thing. And if God can direct our thinking in all of these areas, then we're going to fulfill these basic instincts of life at the level that God intends for us to. And if all human beings on earth fulfill the basic instincts of life at the level that God intended, there would be no conflict on earth today. But all human beings overdo in these areas because they simply are so pleasurable and God made them pleasurable. If he hadn't, if we wouldn't have been doing those things. We wouldn't do what's necessary for survival. And when I saw this information, then I could go back to step three and see, yeah, yeah, I'm going to have to make this decision. On page 61, you know, we never understood this page for a long time until first we begin to see that Bill's talking about the actor here. Once and again, he's using an example of something he thinks we already know about to teach us what he wants to teach us. Remember, the actor was great in New York City. The stage is great in New York City, and Bill assumed people would understand what he's talking about. And then I couldn't understand what he's talking about till I saw those three basic instincts of life. Listen to what he says right up at the top of the page. Everybody, including himself, would be pleased. Life would be wonderful. In trying to make these arrangements, our actor may be sometimes be quite virtuous. He may be kind, considerate, patient, generous, even modest, and self-sacrificing. On the other hand, he may be mean, egotistical, selfish, and dishonest. But as with most humans, he's more likely to have varied traits. Well, what usually happens? Well, the show doesn't come off very well. He begins to think life doesn't treat him right. He decides to exert himself more. He becomes, on the next occasion, still more demanding or gracious as the case may be. Still, the play does not suit him. Admitting he may be somewhat at fault, 
He is sure that other people are more to blame. He becomes angry, indignant, self-pitying. What is his basic trouble? Is he not really a self-seeker, even when trying to be kind? Is he not a victim of the delusion that he can wrest satisfaction and happiness out of this world if he only manages well? Is it not evident that all the rest of the players are these are the things that he wants? And do not his actions make each of them wish to retaliate, snatching all they can get out of the show? Is he not even in his best moments a producer of confusion rather than harmony? You know, I look back in my life, and I could just see so clearly when I wrote the script up here in my head. I wrote the script as to what I'm going to be and what I'm going to have to do in order to be successful. And I set out to fulfill that little play that I had written in my head. Now, that wouldn't have been so bad, though, but I also wrote a script in my head for other people. I wrote a script in my head for my wife. Now, she's going to do this, and she's going to do that, and she's going to be this, and she's going to be that, and people are going to look at her, and they're going to say, oh, what a great fellow Charlie is married to a great lady like that. I also wrote a little script in my head for my kids. Now, they're going to do this, and they're going to do that, and they're going to come this, and they're going to that, and people are going to look at my kids, and they're going to say, oh, what a great husband and father Charlie Reed is. Now, the only thing that I didn't know is they also had their own basic instincts alive. They had written their own script in their head, and their script didn't jive with mine. And they ended up doing things that I didn't think they ought to be doing, or they wouldn't do what I thought they ought to do. So what did I do? Rather than back off and let them be what they wanted to be, then I'm just like the actor here. I exerted more and more pressure trying to force them into the mold that I had drawn for them. Now, that wouldn't have been so bad if I'd have done it just with my family. But, hell, I did it with everybody I know. My friends, the people I work with, and everything else. I was like the actor that wants to run the whole show, trying to wrest satisfaction out of it, trying to be sure that my basic instincts are met, not really concerned about theirs. And every human being is the same way. We've all done it. We all still do it today if we aren't real careful. With the end result that we're in hot water and hot trouble with people, places, and things all the time. I've got to do something about self-will. Now, how am I going to go about getting rid of self-will? See, it's plain now that a life run on self-will could hardly be a success, isn't it? You know, if, if you don't have God in your life, which I didn't until I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, you've got to have a reason for living. And my reason was to satisfy the basic instincts of life. I wanted what I wanted when I wanted it in every area of my life. And if I didn't get what I wanted when I wanted it, somebody was going to get up. I mean, I'd be upset and somebody was going to get it, you know, because I was, I was trying to live my life based upon the satisfaction of these basic instincts. And on page 62, alcoholics got to give up the most important things in our lives. The first thing we have to give up is our alcohol. And the second thing we have to give up is our self-centeredness. Two of the things that we love the most. And this is why it doesn't work. Selfishness and self-centeredness. That, we think, is the root of our troubles. See, we're driven. I was driven. By a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity. We step on the toes of our fellows and they retaliate. Sometimes they hurt us seemingly without provocation. But we invariably find that at some time in the past, we have made decisions based on self which later put us in a position to be hurt. I made decisions based upon the satisfaction of these basic instincts of life, which later put me in a position to be hurt, because nobody can satisfy these basic instincts of life. So our troubles, we think, are basically of our own making. They arise out of ourselves. And the alcoholic is an extreme example of self-will run right, though he usually doesn't think so. Above everything, we alcoholics must be rid of the selfishness we must or it kills us. And God, only God, makes that possible. And there often seems no way of entirely getting rid of self without his aid. Many of us that have had moral and philosophical convictions galore, but we could not live up to them even though we thought we would have liked to. Neither could we reduce ourselves into the much by trying or wishing on our own power. We had to have God's help. Can't heal a sick mind with a sick mind. I have to have God's help.
One of the greatest mistakes I see going on in AA today is too many people are trying to make themselves better. And we simply cannot make ourselves better. Because of the basic instincts of life, we just don't have the power to do that. The only way we're going to be able to get rid of self-will and get better is with God's help, period. And God's the only one that's powerful enough to overcome what He has made, and He's the one who's made self-will in the first place. And like Joe said, a sick mind can't heal a sick mind. We're going to have to have the aid of a power greater than ourselves. He told us how it works, and now He's going to tell, and He told us why it won't work, and now He's going to tell us how it really works. Well, this is the how and why of it. Here's some more instructions. First of all, we had to quit playing God. It didn't work. Now, everything I read today leads me to believe that this is a God-directed world. And those of us who have been self-directed, and those of us that have been trying to direct everything and everybody around us, we've been trying to do God's work for Him. And we're not God. We've just been playing at being God. So the book says we're going to have to quit playing and being God. We're going to have to quit trying to do God's work. We're going to have to start doing the work that we should be doing according to God's will. He says next. Tell us what to do next. Next we decide that hereafter in this drama of life, God was going to be our director. Now he's got his word right back in now. He's not our suggester, our director. And it'll be director and directions the rest of the way through the book. Said he is the principal, and we are his agents. He is the father, and we are his children. Most good ideas are simple. And this concept was the keystone of the new and triumphant arts of which we passed to freedom. I almost missed that. The idea is the simple little old idea that he is the principal, we are the agents. He's the father, we are the children. Most good ideas are simple. See, I got to reading in that other big, big book after I got sober, and there was a story in there. <clears throat> that's told about how he worked for six days and then he rested. And to my knowledge, he'd never go back to work anymore. It looks to me like there's going to be work being done around here. It's going to be me, you see, because he's the father, we're the children. He's the principal, we're the agents. He's the boss. I work for him. Most good ideas are simple. And this concept was a keystone of the new and triumphant march which we have passed to freedom. Now here he's referring again to the wonderfully effective spiritual structure we're going to build. And he's telling us now it's going to be an arch through which we're going to pass to freedom. Step one, willingness was the foundation. Step two, believing was the cornerstone. And now he's telling us step three, decision, is the keystone. And in the old arches, the way they used to build them before they had the mortar and stuff they have today, they build them out of stones up into an arch into a curve. And there was a stone right in the center called the keystone. And if that keystone was shaped right and put in there right, then it would support the entire arch. If the keystone was faulty, if it slipped out, then the arch would collapse. The keystone of the new and triumphant arch to which you and I are going to pass to freedom is the simple little idea as if we're going to let God be the director. He's the father. We're the children. He's the employer. We're the employee. Now, most of us spent most of our time with God telling God what we wanted Him to do. And this is saying we're going to have to quit doing that. We're going to have to start trying to figure out what does God want us to do and start doing His work for Him rather than have Him work for us. In the early days, I used to pray like this. I said, God, help me get my wife back. I need her back. Please help me make more money. Please help me get a new car. I needed that. And I said, if I forgot to ask you for anything, give me that also. You see, very selfish prayer. You see, that kind of prayer doesn't work. You can easily see why. And on page, see, I use God like he would an errand boy. I just sent him out to take care of stuff. You see, he's the principal, and we're the agents. Most good ideas are simple. I need to pray for God's will for me and the power to carry that out. But on page 63, it said, when we sincerely took such a position, he's the father, we're the children, all sorts of remarkable things followed. We had a new employer. 
Being all-powerful, he provided what we needed if we kept close to him and performed his work well. See, I'm supposed to perform his work well. He's not going to perform my work well. Established on such a footing, we became less and less interested in ourselves, our little plans and designs. More and more, we became interested in seeing why we could contribute to life. See, you, don't, you don't have to wait till you get to step 12 mm -hmm. to get something out of this. As we go through these action steps, each one of them now, we're going to have some good, positive results. Nothing negative. Let's look at the results of step three. See, I, was see, I used to see what I could get out of life. Takers or losers, I know today, not only in AA, but in life. I want to see what I can contribute to life today. He says, as we felt new power flow in, as we enjoyed peace of mind, as we discovered we could face life successfully, as we became conscious of his presence, we begin to lose our fear of today, tomorrow, or the hereafter, we were reborn. And boy, I used to hate those guys that come over to my house and talk to me about being reborn. I didn't understand what they meant by that. They come over on Monday night and want to talk to me about reborn from that little church up the street from where I live. You know what I did for them, don't you? I said, hey guys, this is Monday night football. Get out of here. I'm drinking with some of my friends and watching the ball game, and you're over here telling me that stuff. I run them off. See, I didn't understand what they meant and what they were trying to do for me. I mean, I was reading that other big book. This guy's name was Nicodemus, and he was just like me, just dumber than a sack of rocks. Boy, he was dumb. He went to that fellow who was talking about reborn, and he said, what do you mean about being reborn? Do you mean I've got to go back into my mother's womb? I can just see him shaking his head and looking at him, saying, you big dummy. Don't you know you can't do that? When I'm talking to you about the being reborn, I'm talking about the renewing of your mind. Ideas, emotions, and attitudes, which were the guiding force of the lives of these people, are suddenly cast to one side, and a whole new set of motives begin to dominate them. That is a description of being reborn. Not in my body, but in my head. My mind, old ideas cast aside, new ones accepted. I could understand that. I mean, I could see what I could do and, and do that. I could now make my decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I then understood him because I had a better understanding of it now. You see, we were now at step three. And I knew what they did at that little church up there a couple of blocks from my house, about just about 11 o'clock on every Sunday morning. And they'll be doing it this Sunday morning too. They basically want people to come there and to go down and do the third step prayer. That's what they want. And I couldn't wait till the next Sunday morning. And I got there about two or three minutes before 11. I didn't want to get there too early. I might hear something that would help me, you know. <laughs> so I got there about two or three minutes before 11. And sure enough, they asked people to come down there basically and do the third step prayer. And I went down there as humbly and as honestly and as sincerely as I have ever done anything in my life. And this is what I said. I said, God, I offer myself to you to bear with me and do with me as you will. Take away my difficulty that victory over them may bear witness to those that I will help of your power, your love, and your way of life. May I do your will always. Now, I don't know exactly what happened that morning. I'm not smart enough to, to know. But I do know this. From that morning until this morning, my life hasn't been the same. I know that. It was all it was as if I'd been walking on the dark side of the street all those years. And when I did the third step prayer that morning, it was like I got on the sunny side of the street and I've been walking there ever since. Thank God for the third step prayer. Life is good today. I'm not what I used to be, thank God. I am different. I have been reborn. Not in my body, but in my mind. I don't think like I used to think. We thought well before taking this step, making sure we were ready, that we could at last abandon ourselves utterly to Him. And I think the word utterly means completely, wholeheartedly, the whole ball of wax. I hope you don't make the mistake I did the first time I took step three. I got down on my knees and I said, God, I offer myself to thee to bail with me and do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do thy will, so on, so on, and so forth. And I said, now this applies to my alcohol. Don't fool with my sex life. And I believe I can handle my money too. You take the alcohol and I'll take the rest of it. <laughs> 
God probably said, water and order. I can't go through with it. <laughs> and I think the fallacy and the kind of statement I made to him is simply this. I don't think God even drinks. He don't want the alcohol. Hell, he wants me. He wants all of me. Just think. If God could direct my entire thinking, then maybe it would become better not only in regards to alcohol, but maybe in regards to sex, maybe in regards to monetary matters, maybe in regards to all walks of life. And my thinking might become better in all walks of life, and my life might become better in the same way. We're asking him to take over, to direct our thinking entirely and completely. We found it very desirable to take this spiritual step with an understanding person, such as our wife, best friend, or spiritual advisor. It's better to meet God alone than the one who might misunderstand. <clears throat> you know, back in the beginning when AA was first starting, and they were meeting in Dr. Bob's house, there was never any question about this. When the newcomer was ready to make his surrender, Two or three of the older members would take him upstairs in Dr. Bob's house in the bedroom. They would all get down on their knees, and the newcomer would make his surrender. And after he surrendered, the old-timers would vote on how well he surrendered. And if he didn't do it good enough, he had to turn around and do it again, too. Long been known that prayer taken in the company of other human beings seems to have more depth and seems to be more effective. You know, we are tridimensional creatures. We're meant to live with God, ourselves, and other human beings. And as we use this prayer in the company of other human beings, then we're really beginning to start fitting ourselves back together like God wants us to be in the first place with him, with ourselves, with other human beings. Of course, we don't want to do that. We don't necessarily have to. But all the people I sponsor that I work with, we, we take step three together. And I do that for two reasons. Number one, if they take it with me, then I know they have taken step three. That's the only way I know for sure. Also, every time we do it, it seems to have more depth and more meaning for me and have more effect in my life. I think it's a great idea. Now, we're going to ask you to do a little favor. You don't have to if you don't want to, but just before we close here for our session, we're going to ask you to reach out and hold hands with those on either side of you, if you don't mind doing so. And I'm going to read this little prayer here in the big book, and I'm going to ask you to repeat it after me as I read it. God, I offer myself to Thee. God, I offer myself to Thee. To deal with me and do with me as Thou wilt. To deal with me and do with me as I will. Relieve me of the bondage of self. Relieve me of the bondage of self. That I may better do Thy will. That I may better do Thy will. Take away my difficulties. Take away my difficulties. That victory over them may bear witness. That victory over them may bear witness. To those I would help. To those that I would help. Of thy power. Thy power. Thy love. love and thy way of life. And thy way of life. May I do thy will always. Amen. Amen. You'll never have to worry about step three because you've already taken it today. Amen. Thank you all for being here. What time is it? I believe that John is scheduled to be on here and then refer to this uh, at 4.15. 4.15. And then we'll have dinner and we'll be back here at 7.30. Thank you very much for this afternoon. We'll see you all tonight. Yeah. Here. I told Charlie a while ago I was going to tell a joke and he said, oh no, don't tell a joke. Don't tell <laughs> another one. Charlie's going to tell his though. <laughs> you all think it's time for another joke? Yeah. You know, we told the story in the beginning about the alcoholic's brain and the brain surgeon, etc. 
Well, the one I'd like to tell you now involves not only an alcoholic, but also involves an Al-Anon and an Alateen. And the alcoholic and the Al-Anon and the Alateen had all been to an AA convention over the weekend. And on the way back home, in order to see some different scenery, they decided to take a shortcut out through the hills and be able to look at some different things than they normally got to see. And sure enough, they got out there in the countryside and they got lost. And they were doing their best to find their way out. And it was getting later and later. And finally, they went up to the farmer's house, knocked on the door. The farmer came to the door and they told him the problem, the situation. He said, well, it'd be easy for me to tell you how to get out of here. It's not that big a deal. But he said, it's getting awful close to dark, and probably it'll be dark before you get out of here, and you're going to get lost again. He said, why don't you guys just spend the night here with us, and you can get up and go home in the morning. And they said, well, oh, fine, that would be great. And the farmer said, I only got one problem, though. I said, I can only sleep two of you in the house. One of you will have to go down in the barn and sleep with the animals. And the little Alateen said, oh, let me go down the barn and sleep with the animals. I love animals, and they love me, and everything will just be fine. So they all went to bed with the Alateen down in the barn with the animals. In about an hour, there's a knock on the door. Farmer goes to the door, and there stands the Alateen. He said, man, I can't sleep down there. He said, those pigs are grunting, the cows are mooing, the horse, chickens are clucking, the horses are stomping their feet, and I just can't sleep. And the alcoholic said, well, come on in and go to bed. I'll go down in the barn and I'll sleep with the animals. I was raised on a farm. Be no problem for me. So they all go to bed with the alcoholic down in the barn with the animals. And sure enough, in about an hour, knock on the door. Farmer goes to the door and there stands the alcoholic. And he said, man, I can't sleep down there either. He said, those pigs are grunting, the cows are mooing, the chickens are clucking, the horses are stomping their feet, and I just can't sleep. The Al-Anon said, well, all right, come on in. I'll handle the situation. She said, I knew as usual it'd be up to me to take care of it. I'll go down in the barn and I'll sleep with the animals. So they all go to bed with the Al-Anon down in the barn with the animals. And sure enough, in about an hour, knock on the door. The farmer goes to the door and there stands the pigs and the cows and the chickens. <laughs> If she's anything like the al that I'm married to, I could just see her down in the barn and say, now you horses get over there and shut up, and you chickens get over here. <laughs> we love al -Anon. Joe and I both do. Right. If it hadn't, uh, Telling those kind of stories. I think al is one of the finest things that ever happened to AA. I know it's one of the finest things that happened in our family. If it hadn't been for al Barbara and I wouldn't be married today, I'll guarantee you. She always said, Charlie, you ain't nothing but a damn drunk. And I always said, you ain't nothing but a crazy woman. <laughs> and we got to AA and Al Anon, and we found out we were both right all along. <laughs> Love Al Anon. Okay, this afternoon we, uh, we finished up with step three. We made a decision to turn our will, which is our thinking apparatus, our mind, and our lives, which is our actions, over the care and direction of God as we understand Him. And hopefully, if God directs our thinking, it will become better. And if our thinking becomes better, then surely our actions will become better. And if our actions become better, then surely our lives will become better also. But left on our own resources, we don't really stand a chance. If we continue to operate on self-will, trying to satisfy the basic instincts of life, overdoing in all those different areas, continue to harm people and they in turn retaliate against us, and then we're filled with shame and fear and guilt and remorse and resentment and etc. So we can see where it's absolutely necessary for people like us to make this decision. Now we go down to the bottom of page 63. At the bottom of page 63, it says, Next, we launched out on a course of vigorous action. The first step of which is a personal house cleaning, which many of us had never attempted. Though our decision step three. was a vital and crucial step, 
it could have little permanent effect unless at once followed by a strenuous effort to face and be rid of the things in ourselves which had been blocking us. Our liquor was but a symptom, so we had to get down to causes and conditions. There's probably two things in that paragraph we need to look at. Number one, even though our decision was a vital and crucial step, it could have little permanent effect unless at once followed by a strenuous course of action. And I think we all need to recognize that when we took step three, all we really did in step three is we made a decision. We didn't turn our will and our lives over to the care of God. We made a decision to do so. And I keep hearing people in AA today say, well, you know, I've been sober now about four years. My life's still all screwed up. Don't understand why, because I turned it over to God two years ago when I took step three. Now, we don't really turn anything over in step three. We just make a decision to do that. And even though that's very vital and very important for us to do so, it's really not going to have any good long-time effect unless we follow it up by a strenuous course of action. I think the other thing that's so important in that paragraph we just read is the time element between step three and step four. And we hear this question being asked all the time. How long should you wait to do step four after you've done step three? And we hear all kind of answers. We hear some people say, well, maybe 30 days. Other people say, well, maybe 90 days. Some people say maybe six months. I heard a professional in the field one time counseling people to wait a minimum of two years before you do step four. And our question back to that professional was, how many people have you killed with that statement? You see, we're trying to find a way to live. For not only can we be sober, but we can be peaceful and happy and free. And the longer we put off step four, the longer we remain restless and irritable and discontented. The longer we remain filled with shame, fear, guilt, and remorse. And sooner or later, not feeling good, the mind starts thinking about relief and it begins to remember the sense of ease and comfort that comes at once by taking a couple of drinks. Next thing you know, we become insane. We convinced ourselves we can drink and we end up drunk all over again. I really have no idea how long I could go between steps three and steps four without getting drunk. And frankly, I'm not very interested in finding out. The book tells me when to take step four. He said I should follow step three at once with a strenuous effort to face and be rid of those things within me that will be blocking me off from carrying out that decision. And you know, that does make sense, doesn't it? Four, as I know, four has always followed almost immediately after three. Now, knowing that, knowing that if we continue to procrastinate, then why would we not want to go ahead and take step four? And I think a lot of times the reason we don't want to take step four is simply fear. A lot of the older members in AA tend to play king off of the mountain with this step. They tend to tell the newcomer how tough it is. By God, you just wait till you get to step four. Blah, 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 blah. And we just literally scare them to death with it. And let us be the first to say tonight that if we do step four the way the big book says to do it, there's really nothing there to be afraid of, period. And I think we're going to find that as we go through it, if we do it the way the big book says to do it. Okay, if fear does not keep us from doing it, or fear keeps us from doing it, then what else might keep us from doing it? And I think another reason that we tend to procrastinate on step four is simply we don't understand how to do it. The instructions on how to do it are here in the book but they are written and so short and so sweet and so simple that we alcoholics with our keen intellectual alcoholic minds looking for something more complicated have overlooked the simplicity of instructions in step four. They are very short, 
They are very simple if we follow them according to the way the book does. So back in the beginning with all this confusion going on, not knowing how to do it, not understanding how to do it, being afraid of doing it, some of us went over into step five and we saw a statement that said something about sharing all your life story. And we said, oh, that must have been what they wanted us to do in step four is write our life story so we could share it with somebody else in step five. And many of us, myself included, that's the way we took step four in the beginning. Now, I wrote my life story. It probably wasn't too important to other people, but it must have been to me. There was about 92 pages in it. And I took it to another poor, suffering alcoholic and asked him to read it. And he read it, and he said, not very pretty, is it? And I said, no. And he said, you'll never have to be that way again. He threw it in the waste paper basket. And I learned nothing to contribute to my alcoholism by the writing of my life story. Today, as I look back at it, I realize that 95% of my life story has nothing to do with my alcoholism anyhow. Well, the fact that I was born in 1929, I don't think that's got a thing to do with my alcoholism. Might have with somebody else's alcoholism, but not mine. The fact that I graduated from high school at age 17 went directly into the service. I don't think that had a thing to do with my alcoholism. The fact that I was married at age 21, I don't think that's got anything to do with my alcoholism. I'll tell you what it did do. The 95% very, that had nothing to do with it very effectively covered up the 5% that did. And I learned nothing to contribute to my alcoholism by sharing my life story. So in our confusion, getting more and more confused all the time, somebody in Minneapolis, Minnesota, wrote a four-step inventory guide. We got hold of the four-step inventory guide, we combined it with a big book, and we got more confused yet. Somebody in Dallas, Texas, wrote a four-step inventory guide. We took the Dallas guide, combined it with the Minneapolis guide, combined it with the big book. We got more confused yet. I have no idea how many inventory guides are floating around out there today. We saw one not too long ago that had 20 pages in it. And I'll guarantee you, if you wasn't crazy as hell before you took it, you would be when you were through with it. It was one of those. And all the time, the instructions have been here in the book. We just simply could not see them. Now, if we're going to be able to do the step four according to the big book Alcoholics Anonymous, we've always got to remember now two things. Number one, Bill loves to use examples of something we already know in order to teach us something new. Bill also hates to repeat himself using the same words. When he repeats himself, he will usually find a different word that means the same thing. So bearing these two things in mind, let's just look at a few little simple ideas here. Let's kind of relax and take it easy. And let's see if we can't see how simple this thing really is, according to the big book Alcoholics Anonymous. He starts out on the first paragraph. Therefore, we started upon a personal inventory. This was step four. Now, immediately, he jumps from personal to business. He said a business which takes no regular inventory usually goes broke. And I think probably all of us could see that. You know, if you had a business, instead of selling ladies' purses, men's watches, bicycles, or whatever, if you didn't go in there and inventory once in a while, you wouldn't know what's been stolen out of the store that you didn't get paid for. You wouldn't know what's been sold, and you know need to order new stock to put in its place. You wouldn't know what's become out of style. Nobody wants to buy it. It's sitting there taking up valuable floor space and shelf space day after day after day probably paying interest on 
borrowed money to have it there in the first place. If you did the inventory, you wouldn't know what's become damaged and unsaleable goods, and nobody wants to buy those. And they sit there day after day after day and cost you more and more and more money. I think any of us would be able to see that if we had a business and we didn't inventory in that business once in a while, we probably would go broke. Now, I think his first comparison is this. Comparing the personal inventory to the business inventory. You and I have in our personal lives a business also. And it's the business of finding a way to live where not only can we be sober, but we can be peaceful and happy and free so we don't have to go back to drinking again. And if we don't inventory in our personal business, then chances are we're going to go broke too. And going broke for us is simply to go back to drinking. So I think his first valid comparison is whether we take a personal inventory or a business inventory in either case, we'll go broke without it. Now then, he proceeds us to tell us how to take this business inventory, assuming we know something about it. He says, taking a commercial inventory. Now, Dad burned him. He could have said business again, couldn't he? But he don't want to repeat himself twice, so he'll say commercial instead of business. The same thing. Taking a commercial inventory is a fact-finding, and we're going to take some key words out of the big book and put them up here on the screen. On one side we got business inventory, the other side we got personal inventory. And we're taking the words fact-finding and putting them up on the screen under business. It is a fact-finding and a fact-facing process. We're putting fact-facing on the screen under business. It is an effort to discover the truth, and we're putting truth on the screen under business, about the stock in trade, and we're putting stock in trade on the screen under business. Now, the stock in trade is what's in there for sale. That's the ladies' purses, the men's watches, the bicycles, etc. That's the stock in trade. One object is to disclose damage and unsaleable goods. And we're putting damage and unsaleable goods on the screen under business. And to get rid of them promptly and without regret. And we're putting promptly and without regret on the screen under business. Now, is there anybody here would have any problem with what he just told us to do in a business inventory? We're going to go in there and we're going to Try to find the facts. When we find them, we are going to face the fact. We're trying to discover the truth about the stock in trade. And we're looking for the damaged and unsaleable goods. Now, the good items that sell every day, they don't cause us to go broke. We're looking for the damaged and unsaleable goods. And when we find them, we're going to get rid of them promptly and without regret. Because unless they are moved out of the store, we can't put good items back in their place. So we're going to have to get rid of them promptly and without regret. Now he says, if the owner of the business is to be successful, <clears throat> he cannot fool himself about values. In other words, he's going to have to be just as true and truthful with himself as he absolutely can. Sometimes the owner will try to fool himself. He may say, well, the reason these ladies aren't buying these purses is they just don't really know what's good for them. You know, he, he, he made the decision to buy them in the first place, and he hates to admit that he's wrong. And he may be afraid to face the truth about them, and he may hold on to them longer and longer than he should. And if he does, it's going to cost him money every time. So he's going to have to be absolutely truthful with himself to the best of his ability. Anybody have any problem with any of these statements that Bill just made about a business inventory? I think we can all see it. We can see the validity behind it. 
and really understand what he's trying to say. Now watch it. He said we did exactly the same thing with our lives. In other words, he wants us to do in our lives what he just told us to do in the business inventory. And he wrote a little step for us telling us how to do this. And he used a series of words in step four that mean basically the same thing as the words that he's used here in the business inventory. He said we made a searching. And we're putting searching straight across from fact-finding. They mean the same identical thing, to find the facts, to search out the facts. We made a searching and fearless. And we're putting fearless straight across from fact-facing to fearlessly look at those things, to face those facts as they really are. He said we made a searching and fearless moral. And there's where we got in trouble. We said, oh, crap, there it is. There's that list of dirty, filthy, nasty items. And we don't want to look at them ourselves. We sure as hell don't want to show them to somebody else. Well, I'm not really sure what old Bill Wilson knew. But I know one thing, this guy understood the English language. And I really believe if he'd wanted you and I to make a list of dirty, filthy, nasty items, he would have said we made a searching and fearless amoral or immoral inventory. He didn't say that, he said moral. And it bugged us, and it bugged us, and it bugged us, until finally we went back to the dictionary. And do you know what moral is defined as in a dictionary? Nothing in the world but truth. Things as they really are. The facts of the matter as they actually exist. The real truth about something. So moral and truth means the same thing. We made a searching and fearless moral inventory of what? Of ourselves. We are the only stock in trade that we have in this business of staying sober. Nobody else can make us sober. Nobody else can make us drink. Oh, I'll agree they can make us thirsty as hell once in a while. But they can't make us drink, nor they can make us stay sober. We are the ones that determine whether we stay sober or not. Now, what part of our cells determine whether we stay sober or not? Is it our body? Or is it our mind? The real problem of the alcoholic centers in the mind rather than the body. So as I make this searching and fearless moral inventory of myself, I look into my mind and I try to find the stock in trade that is damaged, the damaged and unsaleable goods, the faulty, flawed thinking that blocks me off from the sunlight of the Spirit, and keeps me from carrying out the decision I made in step three. And the book says, we took stock honestly, morally. First, we searched out the flaws in our makeup which caused our failure. Being convinced that self manifested in various ways that what had defeated us, we considered its common manifestations. And it said, resentment is the number one offender. It destroys more alcoholics than anything else. From its stem, all forms of spiritual disease, we've been not only mentally and physically ill, we've been spiritually sick. When the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. In dealing with resentments, we set them on paper. What I like to do for myself as I begin to look at this inventory, I like to imagine my mind up here as a little bitty store. Not very much in it. A little bitty quick trip or a get and go or a come and get it or one of those kind of stores. Not a hell of a lot in there. And over here in this side of my store, I have some display cases that are filled with resentments. Damn him, and damn her, and by God, I'll show them, and blah de blah 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 Those display cases are already filled 
with the damage and unsaleable goods called resentment. There's no way that God can enter my mind and fill those display cases. He is very effectively blocked out by the resentments. Over here in this part of my store, I have a little file cabinet, and it's filled with fear. Oh, my God. What's she going to do when she finds out about this one? Oh, my God. What's the banker going to say when that hot check gets there? He's already told me he'll file on me. Next. Oh, my God. What's the boss going to say when he finds Oh, my God. Is that my car sitting out in the front, the Tory in the front end torn up, and I don't even, oh, my God, and on and on. And those, that file cabinet is already completely filled with fear. God's thinking can't enter there because he's very effectively blocked out. In the back of my store, I have a little storage room. And it's filled with shame and fear and guilt and remorse associated with the things I've done to hurt other people. As we've said before, we're not drunken bums. We have consciences. We know the difference between right and wrong. We do those things while drinking. We normally would not do sober. And the guilt and the remorse just begins to eat us up. And that storeroom is filled with that stuff, and God's very effectively blocked out of there. There's no way that he can enter my mind unless I do something about those damaged and unsaleable goods and get them out of there so he, in turn, can enter my mind and begin to direct my thinking. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the first common manifestation, this thing called resentments. A lot of people have difficulty in determining what a resentment is. It's really very simple. The word resentment is made up of two old, old words. The first part of that word, re, R-E, is from an old, old word that means to do again, to do over. Like repaint, replay, re always means to do again. The last part of that word, sentiment, comes from an old word called sedentary, which means to feel. So the word resentment really means to re-feel. Now let's say that we're going through this. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.